Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our celebration of the first 50 years of Luton Sixth Form College, the first true Sixth Form College in England. I'd like to welcome the many distinguished guests who've joined us today, including two former principals, Brian Houseman and Simon Kitchener, uh, Lord Mackenzie of Luton, the Chief Executive of Luton Borough Council, Trevor Holden, our two MPs, uh, Kelvin Hopkins and Gavin Chuka, and the worshipful Tahir Khan, uh, Mayor of Luton. We're delighted that you have all been able to join us here on our special day. Now, much has been written about the slightly fatuous nature of anniversaries. Uh, it's often been said that there's really no difference between 49 years, 50 years, 51 years. Uh, I suppose 50 looks a bit prettier on the front of the building than 49. But I, I hope you'll take my point that it's really just an arbitrary point in the history of a person or an institution. Uh, and of course, we're not the only contender for celebrating anniversaries. We've had 100 years since the Battle of the Somme, 400 years since Sh Shakespeare's birth, or was it death? 50 years since England beat Iceland in the World Cup final, <laughs> or something. And perhaps, of course, recent events have given us another possible anniversary in the future. When this college, in another 50 years, celebrates 100 years of Luton Sixth Form College, well, they'll also be celebrating 50 years since the UK voted to leave the European Union. Now, leaving aside the anniversary date, debate, I believe that this is a fitting time to reflect on the history of this college. Because not only has it been here quite a long time, more significantly, I think, it was the very first of its type in the country. It was an experiment and I think this is an appropriate time to ask whether the experiment has been successful. And let's begin by briefly looking back 50 years to mark the courage and vision of those pioneers in Luton. Now, some of you who are um, historians will know that the Rochdale pioneers were credited with the founding of the cooperative movement. And I would like to suggest that the Luton pioneers can be credited with the founding of the Sixth Form College movement. And you can read the story in the souvenir brochure. I suppose it's a familiar tale of the interplay of local and national politics. And I don't know anything about the personalities involved, although I know that some of you do, because I was talking uh, um, earlier to, to some folks who remember the people involved. What I think we can say about those people is that they demonstrated real courage and vision, persistence, and the ability to communicate their vision to others. But there was risk. And naturally, there were vociferous opponents, as I understand it. Well, I hope you will agree with me today that the persistence of those few has been rewarded. They have been vindicated. I believe the experiment was a success. And I know that there are some uh, for whom it's a matter of regret that that experiment hasn't been replicated many, many times over throughout England. I'm looking at Kelvin at this point. But we're not doing politics today. As I thought about this speech, it occurred to me that recent events provide us with an opportunity to reflect on the permanence of institutions. We're living, living through rather unsettling times at the moment where it appears that much of what we've taken for granted over the years is looking fragile and perhaps no longer fit for purpose. Some of the fundamental building blocks of government here and in Europe and in the United States now look weak and unstable. This would include much of the so-called machinery of government and democratic institutions and structures which have served us well for a century or more. So, what is it about this college which makes it seem, 50 years on, to be permanent, deep-rooted, resilient, and very much fit for purpose. With respect to former principals and myself, I would like to begin by being a little self-deprecatory. 
A quote from somebody generally regarded as one of the great writers about leadership and management, Peter Drucker. And he said, no institution can possibly survive if it needs geniuses or supermen to manage it. It must be organised in such a way as to be able to get along under a leadership composed of average human beings. So, yes, I'm sorry, Mr Houseman and Mr Kitchener. It seems it's not due to the fact that we three are geniuses. <laughs> but it is due to the way the college has been organised for survival. And I would like to pay tribute at this point to my two predecessors for the great work they did to help make the college a place that survives with ordinary human beings uh, at the helm. I think it's instructive to spend a few minutes thinking about some of the reasons why some of the institutions around us do seem to be struggling. And it seems to me that uh, failing institutions share a number of common characteristics. They have a tendency to put the needs of their members before the needs of the people they were designed to serve. They lose sight of their core values. They suffer from hubris, complacency, lack of courage, lack of energy and commitment to necessary change, lack of vision. They become distracted from their core purpose and sometimes they overreach themselves. They often suffer from poor governance. And this college, why are we still here? Well, there's a, qu a quote from the novel The Leopard by Lampedusa, which is very relevant here, I think. Some of you may know this one. In this book, one of the characters, Tancredi, when considering how the family dynasty can survive the threat of impending change in society, ventures the view, if we want everything to remain the same, everything must change. It's a great paradox, and I believe there's a great profound truth in it. In one sense, everything here has changed, but in another, more important respect, nothing has changed. The college is very much larger now than it was in 1966. The curriculum is different. The students look different. They speak very differently. They wear different clothes. And, of course, they're all pretty much surgically attached to some kind of electronic device or other. <laughs> However, if someone who worked at the college in 1966, and I know that there's at least two in, people in here who did, if they were to visit the college now and spend some time speaking to the young people here, they would find that their dreams, aspirations, hopes, fears, strengths and weaknesses are exactly the same as those young people who were here in the 1960s. They would discover too that the students are still and always will be a great inspiration to us, the older generations. That person would find that the college is still operating for the benefit of young people of Luton. And it is still very much open access as it was when it was set up 50 years ago. It's still full of dedicated and inspiring teachers, support staff and governors who work tirelessly to help the large numbers of people in this town, young people, to progress. And in many cases, most cases actually, to university. Now it has been said, and I really believe this, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And actually, I believe the experience of the recent referendum really bears this out. When many people apparently rejected the evidence of experts and relied instead on something more visceral. It is also the reason why people choose schools and colleges. I believe they are drawn to values, reputation, behaviours, much more than data, performance tables, Ofsted reports. And I think we're all familiar with this. When we talk to people about why they chose this college or this school, that is what they buy into, why we do it rather than how we do it. And it's well known that what people want for their children, of us from a school or college, is somewhere where their son or daughter will be safe, happy, well-taught, guided carefully onto the next steps in their careers. Not so much what we do as why we do it. And why we do it is because we want to make a difference. We want to help young people, many of whom in this town are from relatively disadvantaged backgrounds. We want to help them to experience the transformational effects of education on their futures. Looking forward, I believe there are very exciting times ahead for this town and this college. And if you don't believe me, listen carefully to what Trevor Holden has to say a little bit later. 
And I believe that in many ways, this college and this town exemplifies a vision of what the new Britain could and should be. We can show the rest how it is possible for people to live in a very diverse community, to live together safely and in relative harmony. We show that it is possible to learn to respect and enjoy cultures that are very different from our own. We show that it is possible for people from different, different ethnic backgrounds, different cultures and different faiths to show tolerance and respect for one another. And we also show how it's possible for young people who are determined and focused to achieve very much more than what them might ever have been expected from them. Now, I don't claim that these attributes are unique to this college, but I do believe, honestly believe, that Luton, this town, is unique and special in many ways. And I can say quite honestly, it's a great privilege to be able to serve such a powerful and vibrant and exciting community. So, in summary, let's salute those who showed courage, vision and persistence in the past. Let's celebrate the longevity and health of the college today and reflect on the extent to which it has remained true to its mission, purpose and values. And finally, as we look forward, let us envisage a bright future for Luton and let's envisage the con continuing contribution that this college will make as a shining example of an inclusive, harmonious, resilient institution committed to improving social mobility while fostering creativity and enterprise and producing generations of highly skilled, confident, happy and kind young people. Thank you. And that is a cue to bring forward some of those confident and kind young people. Could you come out, please, five of you, thank you, and, and take a seat here. <laughs> Thank you. That was some footage that was um, sent to us actually just a few days ago. The, the, uh, there is a project at the moment, in fact they're returning tomorrow and they've been there for two weeks. The Malawi project, I'm going to ask Emily to come up now to tell us a bit about this. Thank you, Emily. So I'm going to, to ask you first of all, can you tell us a little bit about what the Malawi project is all about? Thank you. Um, the Malawi project is about um, just giving back to people who are less fortunate to us. We went out for two weeks and did a variety of different projects out there. The main one being working in schools for the first week and we were paired up with someone else on our trip. Um, going with a little bit of knowledge about what we were going to be teaching but mostly just adapting to the ages and the ability when we got out there. Uh, the second main part of the trip was to um, renovate the school's libraries that we were working in and when we first got there there were basically just abandoned rooms and this was a lot more hands-on we did a lot more cleaning painting organizing of books as well um, most evenings we went and um, visited Staker which is the orphanage you just saw in the video clip there um, it was basically organized by a man called God knows um, who decided to um, take in kids from the street and um, kids who were just having a really bad upbringing and him and his wife invited them into his home and 
care for them as their own children. Um, so that was what we were mostly doing out there. We also did other activities like visiting the hospital, mm. the um, little kids in the hospital, learning about the new technology mm -hmm. and the new, um, what's the word? Approaches. Uh, right, in the hospital. Yeah. In the hospital. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Good. Thank you, Emily. And I, I'd like to ask you, why did you choose? Why did you choose to join this project? When I first heard about it, when we first started uh, Sixth Form, I thought it's such a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And not many people would say that they would get to go, one, to Malawi, and secondly, in a group project with mm. the college as well, um, going out to do charity work, something that I've always wanted to do. So when the opportunity came up, I thought it would be a really good experience. And um, we go out there as well. And I didn't really know anyone who would go out in the group, apart from one girl who was friends with. And I can honestly say that we've become genuine friends mm -hmm. after going there as well. And it pushed me out of my comfort zone, and I know a lot of other people as well. But I think that it was a really good challenge to do, and it's made me a lot stronger person. Thank you. And that was going to be my final question, really. How do you think it has benefited you, apart from making a stronger person? Can you say anything else? How do you think it's prepared you for your future? Um, Obviously, you, you learn quite a lot about yourself when you're put into a difficult mm. situation like that. And there was times that things came up, especially when we visited the hospital. It was really hard um, to see people in such less fortunate conditions than yourselves. I think, one, it makes you appreciate what you have such a lot more. Um, also, I think leadership skill-wise, it's really helped me. Um, I feel like I was much more comfortable and confident in myself to actually mm. take a leadership role as well, and I think that's also good going on to the future, mm. working environments, other projects as well, which I definitely want to get involved mm. in after I've done the Malawi project. Thank you, and I think we'll agree that it certainly made Emily a very confident speaker. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to invite up now Joanne and, and Safia, if you'd like to come up, please, together. Now, Joanne and Safia have both been on the student council this year. They're still, they're, they're, uh, still at the college. They finished their first year. I'm going to ask them both to introduce themselves, say what you are studying at the moment and what your plans are for the future. So, Joanne first. Uh, hi, my name is Joanne Asma McLean. I'm 17, and at this college I study English literature, history, chemistry, and government and politics, and I'm hoping to go on to study law in the future. Thank you. Hi, I'm Safia, and I'm studying economics, history, biology, and geography, and I'd like to do a geography degree in university. Great, thank you very much. Now, I'm going to ask Joanne, you're going to talk about a little bit about student council. And Safi, you're going to tell us a little bit about your role as a student governor. Is that right? So, Joanne first. Thank you. This year's student council has been amazing at being able to provide opportunities for the student body. So, for example, this year we held a diversity show where um, people were able to come together and celebrate different cultures, different backgrounds, and it really helped the student body to come together as one. We also held a humanity day as well, and we held a one-minute silence for all the, current, all the countries which are currently at conflict. As well as, as well as raising awareness for those who are affected by child labour and child trafficking. Um, we've held a number of successful focus groups and the suggestion and complaints procedure allows the um, student body to put forward what they would really want to see more of in the college. Um, well, yeah, we've helped um, fund for children in need by um, doing a bucket collection when um, members of the student council went round and um, in... Uh, different uh, costumes and different outfits to help raise awareness for this charity. And lastly, I'm so happy to have um, worked with all of the student council this year. Thank well you. done. There's a lot to remember there, a lot yeah. of activity. Well done. Well done. <laughs> and Safi is going to say a little bit about what being on the governing body of the college has been like. Now, you better be careful because there are lots of governors out here. So you better not say it's been really boring and the governors are all horrible. <laughs> Okay, where you go. Um, being a student governor is exciting, not only because I get a snazzy cool title. <laughs> um, I get to sit on two meetings, and I know some people might think that's boring, but I find it quite exciting. Um, at the governor meetings, um, there's loads of decisions and uh, discussions made, and I think my role is offering the student opinion 
representing our voices and our interests. I also give um, a quarterly update about how the Student Council is performing, which is quite nerve-wracking because I have to talk in front of all the governors, which is nice to have Joanne there to help me. <laughs> Um, also, at the student council meetings, I take notes that I've taken and I present them and um, make any changes that might need me. Great, thank you. And final question for you both, really, is to just say, how do you think you've benefited from this work that you've been doing with the student council and, and the, on being on the governing body? How has it helped you, do you think, for your futures? Um, I've certainly become uh, more independent ever since I came to this college. The teachers here have been very supportive of me. We have wonderful facilities, we have a wonderful LRC, we have a wonderful study centre and it's also helped me to not only grow academically but also improve myself as a person as well. Um, being a member of the Student Council, I've been able to improve my time management so I'm able to balance my extracurricular activities as well as um, my studies. I've been I've gr I've grown more confident, definitely, because I don't think I've been able to have done this last year. Uh, <laughs> and um, I've been able to communicate with people better. I've been able to work better as part of a team and cooperate with uh, members of the Student Council also. And yeah, that's, thank yeah, that's you. That's quite a lot. Well <laughs> done. Great. Thank you. And Safia. So it's how you benefited from your time at the college, but also uh, as, a, as a member of the Student Council and the Governor. Anything you'd like to say about that? I think Joanne said most of everything that I was <laughs> going to say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think that I've benefited in being the Student Council because I've grown more confident. I know the people that are around me in class know that I'm quite a shy person. Mm. Um, really? Yes. <laughs> hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> you don't um, seem shy. I have students and I have a great, amazing group of friends and I have mm. teachers that always push me to do strive my best and to be who I should be and build on my character. I've mm. also worked on my time management skills and I've really flourished, mm. I think. Thank you. That's a lovely phrase. They've helped you to be who you should be. I like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> like to sit down. Yeah. Now, at half past seven this morning, I was out the back of the college waving off a group who are heading off to the Lake District. It won't rain, will it? It never rains in the Lake District. <laughs> and they're doing two groups doing their Duke of Edinburgh Gold Award. And at this point, I'd like to call up Alistair, who's going to uh, tell us something about this. Alistair, can I start by asking you to say, uh, to introduce yourself, say what courses you're doing and what your plans are for the future, please? Uh, hello, my name is Alistair. Um, I just finished my first year at the University of Portsmouth. I'm currently doing American Studies and History. Um, still got another two years to go, uh, which includes a term abroad, hopefully. And after that, I'm either going to go on to a master's or possibly look for a job, but I'm not too sure about that at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Could you, could you, sorry, I've got the mic. Yeah. Could you say a little bit about how this college helped prepare you for that and possibly for the future as well? Um, so, firstly, you've got the, of course, the courses. The courses help you just prepare for like, learning um, and, um, for example, in history, it's obviously going to help, but with other subjects as well. It's learning about time management, about um, revising, and all that. But more importantly, what this college does, it gives you a lot more um, opportunities than just learning stuff um for example i was a member of the hockey team um that got me um great friends i had a good fun we did lose quite badly every game <laughs> um but i scored once so it's okay <laughs> <laughs> um and but as well as that i did the duke of edinburgh as well yeah and i'd like you to tell us a little bit i know some people will be very familiar with the duke of edinburgh award but some perhaps just no, they their only knowledge of it is that group of bedraggled youngsters staggering through the countryside with massive bags on their backs there's a bit of that isn't there but can you tell us give us a flavor of what the gold award I I is about alistair so the gold award has five different areas so of course there's the ha um rainy very <laughs> very long hike which is about 20 kilometers Oh, every day for four days. Uh, sounds a lot, but you just get on with it and have bad shoulders and bad feet and everything else afterwards. Um, but apart from that, you've got volunteering. So I did 18 months working in a charity shop. Um, after, as well as that, you do a sport. So that was with the Luton Six Form hockey team. Um, then the last two are skill so I did my driving lessons so I learned how to drive for the first time which was a bit scary but I think everyone knows how that is and then finally I did um, a residential up in the 
Iron Bridge, where I helped paint a youth hostel. Mm. Thank you. And final question is stacking all that together, you know, your experience here, but particularly the, the Duke of Edinburgh experience. How did that help you, do you think? What kind of skills has that uh, helped you to develop? Um, so one way um, it's helped me develop is with the volunteering, um, working in the charity shop has helped me get a summer job this summer. Um, I work in Mark Spencer's in St Albans. So not trying to promote it here, just, <laughs> <laughs> just saying. I <laughs> suspect there are quite a few Marks and Spencer shoppers in here already, Alistair. Just a, a thought, maybe. Um, <laughs> um, with regards to my residential, I had to plan going to this youth hostel, going on the train for the first time, like long distance, um, actual accommodation and food, and that's helped me prepare for university life. Um, and then finally, the hike, it, it does. It sounds like it's hard, and it can be quite hard if you if you have the weather like today, and it's absolutely lovely. But unfortunately for me, it was raining every single day. So, um, and you learn quite a lot about perseverance, and you realise that you do can go much further than you think you can. Mm, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> The word resilience comes to mind there. That's a popular word now, but I think there's plenty of that if you do a DV expedition. And finally, I'd like to welcome Bion, who left us a few years ago. As he's got quite an exciting ex set of experiences to tell us about. So I'm going to hand over to Bion. Can you tell us what you did here at the college, what courses, and what you've done since, Bion? Thank you. Okay, so I was here about... Um, well, I started here five years ago. I look exactly the same. Um, so I did um, English, um, history and business um, and I, grad um, I finished here with ABB, I didn't get the grades I wanted to get, um, that was a very faithful day, um, as my mum could attest to. Um, so then I went to um, Nottingham, I did industrial economics, it was like, industrial economics is like a mixture of business and economics, for some reason I wanted to be a banker but then that changed. Um, so I did uh, my first year and second year just doing stuff on the side. So, for example, I was doing apps, uh, websites, running social media um, accounts. And then in my second year, um, I did a, a program, a student program with um, Google, and it was co called the Global Marketing Campaign. Um, so what we had to do was um, run a marketing campaign for a random business. Um, ours was a hairdresser, so apart from this thing on my head, I don't know much <laughs> about hair. Um, um, I did quite well in that, I won top men uh, mentee, then um, um, they put me forward to applications for the internship. Um, I was lucky enough to get that, I interned over in Dublin for three months, amazing place. Came back, um, then I was offered a job, completed my final year, graduated with a 2-1, um, and now I'm going back there in October. Great, thank you. That's pretty exciting. Well done. <laughs> and when Beyond was here, he was part of the programme that was then called the Career Academy. It's now called Career Ready. And you were the first cohort, weren't you, of uh, Career Academy. Can you tell us a little bit about what the Career Academy was and how it helped to prepare you for what came next? Thank you. Um, so Careers Academy was, is sort of like a, a business orientated um, sort of society sort of thing um, where it's also sort of orientated around sort of getting you real life sort of exposure to um, sort of business and so on and so on. So that was actually where I first got my, um, my first sort of job I was working at a marketing firm, um, I mean sorry, a, a security firm doing their marketing. Um, and what was really interesting about um, the whole arrangement there was at 17 I was able to do pretty much anything I wanted in then it was really sort of an eye-opener and um, sort of set me on the right path to, to let me know sort of what I wanted to do. Um, I think some of the unique things about um, sort of Careers Academy is and the, I still see the benefits from it today. So say for example all the contacts that I still interact with in terms of um, professional context um, all find their route um, back to either Sufian or the Careers Academy team um, and just you don't really get that real life sort of prepara preparation you do um, in just academics you sort of do need to branch out and that's where Careers Academy is and I found that in the schools I went to before I didn't really get that whereas 
when I came to Luton sixth form, um, that's what sort of made it stand out, and that's where I sort of found myself in a sense. That's what I really wanted to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bion. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs> but, <laughs> and I'm sure you'll agree that the students demonstrate much more eloquently than I could in my speech what the college is for, why we do it, and what we do. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. I'm, I'd like to hand over now to uh, Trevor Holden, who's the Chief Executive of Luton Borough Council. Thank you, Trevor. Um, good morning, and thank you. It's a huge, huge privilege to be here this morning and to be able to address such an audience. Um, thank you very much. Beyond, I know less about hair dressing than maybe <laughs> you do. Um, so when I was asked to come and speak this morning, I wondered where I might go because I'm not an academic and I thought actually to speak to such an audience is going to be quite a challenge. And I look back actually at the role of education in my own life and actually what we are doing in Luton through a thing called the Luton Investment Framework and found that those things just tied together. So for those of you th that know me will maybe not recognise the fact that I actually carry a handle of Wing Commander because my career before I came into local government was in the Royal Air Force. And people often say, you are so lucky because the Air Force gave you so much opportunity. Having joined the Royal Air Force in the ranks, growing up in a council house with seven siblings, that's quite a lot in a small council house, left school with not really much of an education. People look to the Royal Air Force and say they really gave you an opportunity, fundamentally missing the point that education was the key to unlocking that opportunity. So the Royal Air Force has a motto um, in Latin, which is there in front of you, which translates as, through adversity to the stars. I felt today celebrating 50 years of this fantastic institution, I might take license and corrupt that motto just a little bit, um, which I'm reliably told, through education to the stars. And that's where we're really at. I think Luton has a fantastic opportunity. We're at a point in history where we're absolutely poised to maximise the opportunity of Luton's ge geographical location, the skills, the aspirations and the super diversity of a place, which is absolutely a role model for the rest of the country, if not the world. The key to us exploiting that opportunity is the vibrancy and passion of our young people and the education that we afford them to help them realise their ambitions and our ambitions for the place. So Maslow describes his um, motivational theory through a hierarchy of need. And I've drawn along the side Luton Investments framework and I think through education, through skills, through learning, through catering in education, through the needs of the whole person because we must never forget that success comes in so many different ways and I think academia and government over time has maybe talked about success as being two A levels in a degree, success as being a scout leader, success as being a worthwhile citizen, education is key to help those things happen. We need as leaders in a community and a place, provide the opportunities, the very best opportunities, for our young people through education, but just also in our economy, that they can realise their potentials and be the people, as was mentioned earlier, that they are destined to be. So as we work through Luton's investment framework, we'll talk about the built environment, but the built environment is just the vehicle through which we provide the opportunity for people to flourish and be the very best that they can. Education is part of a cycle. If we can move to the next, and the next, sorry. Education is part of a system. And for some time, educational institutions were allowed to see themselves as an entity in their own right, autonomous from the economy in which they operated. 
through Luton Sixth Form's history, it's always been part of the economy of the town, anchored in the success of the town. And as we go forward, we need to make sure that education and skills are key to support the employment opportunities that we'll generate through growing the economy. That we celebrate our diversity and our heritage and the rich culture that goes to make our complex community. So turning to the next slide, the investment framework, some of which you will have perhaps heard about. Let me explain some of the opportunities. Luton Airport is the fastest growing airport in the country. Year on year growth of 20%. That in itself is an interesting statistic, but the impact on our economy is huge. Luton its geographical position, as government talks about a Cambridge to Oxford arc with London as the anchor at the bottom, Luton's geographical position absolutely places it at the centre of the economic vibrance of the country. It is not just of local and regional significance, it's of national significance. <coughs> We've got massive planning applications in. As people start to realise investing in Luton might be a really, really good thing to do. That's business people who want to see a turn on their money. It's business people who want to make a difference to the way people live their lives and the opportunities that they have. This is not a pipe dream. These planning applications are either in or on their way in. As you go around the place, you can't help but see the level of investment that's going into the built environment. Again, the built environment is just the vehicle through which we release the opportunities for the way people live their lives. The next slide gives you some really, really interesting statistics that you may or may not know. The investment framework will deliver 18,500 new jobs, quality jobs. Luton is the top city for broadband connectivity in the country. We have the best schools in the eastern region in terms of the number of children attending Ofsted rated good or better schools. Better than Norfolk, better than Suffolk, better than Cambridge. This is an outrageous story which we don't tell often enough. If you were looking for a place to do business within the reach, a two hour reach of this town, there are 23 million people encompassing London, Oxford and Cambridge. Where better to place your business? 22 minutes from the centre of London with grand rents which are a fraction of the cost in London. Why wouldn't you invest in Luton? The next slide gives you one of our very, very rich seams. We talk about a diverse society and some talk about a diverse society almost in an apologetic way. I would suggest to you Luton is a diverse society which makes it a world city, which brings together a richness of culture, a richness of heritage, which is only understood through education because we need to understand each other well to exploit the opportunity of that heritage and culture. It's no accident that Vauxhall's worldwide centre for their, their system that's in cab, if you break down, is here. Why? Because we offer the skills, the languages and the opportunities to deal with a global market. Diversity is really, really important to our town. Education, my next slide. We're investing heavily in preschool, our primary schools, our secondary schools, our FE and our HE. And it works when we see it as a system, not as component parts. And the system in Luton, I would report, is alive and well. And this is one of the crowning glories of that system. I suspect many of our youngsters who leave and go to university might just be slightly disappointed by their level of facility, having been spoilt rotten by the level of facilities that the sixth form college enjoys. All of this, turning to my next slide, drives us to say we are absolutely at a point in Luton's history where if we, and looking around there's a number of you with more or grey hair than me, 
if we don't provide the leadership and passion to deliver the very best we can for the economy of Luton. Because all of the component parts, all of the ingredients are absolutely there. Absolutely there, so to pick up on Chris's point, such that normal men and women leading should be able to make sense of it. That's our challenge. And the growth takes us all the way from pilots to hotel industry, to state-of-the-art defence technologies, to IT, um, to gaming. Absolutely every aspect of the commercial sector coalesces and is represented in Luton. The opportunities are vast going forward for the young people coming out of this sixth form college. But education alone, in terms of academic achievement, we've already heard, isn't what it's about. And turning to the next slide, these are the sixth form values, and we would do well, perhaps, in our lives to take note of these values, because it's about the people, not just the qualification. So students are the focus. Mutual respect. How many times do we see, actually, where we, as um, individuals fail to make sure there's mutual respect, integrity, learning and excellence. Because education attainment itself is but part of the equation. It's the whole person that this college caters for so well, which is the difference between success or failure. It's those life skills and confidence that equip young people to go out into the world and be the very best that they can be which perhaps this next slide demonstrates. You might wonder, why has he put a bunch of baby pictures up when we're here celebrating 50 years? They all should be grey and old, shouldn't they? My, my point here is, the commonality of those pictures is the uniqueness of every individual that's there. We are all born absolutely unique. And then for some reason, we live in a society where we teach ourselves to conform. That is just outrageous to deny the individuals that we're supposed to be. I would suggest, and I think I've already picked up from my time visiting the college and from this morning's presentations, that actually this college caters for the individual and encourages the individual to celebrate their uniqueness and their richness. And absolutely to live each day with the wonderment of their first and the energy of their last. We have to remember there's only one like you, and some would say, crikey, that's a good job, isn't it? Um, certainly my children would. Um, but it's that individuality that adds the richness to the tapestry that makes us a cohesive and fantastic community. So, in conclusion, I would absolutely like to say thank you to the governors, past and present, whose vision and aspiration have made this an educational institution par excellence. Thank you to the principals, past and present, for their leadership and determination to deliver the very best for the young men and women of Luton. Thank you to the staff, past and present, for their inspiration and commitment in helping the young people of Luton to be the very, very best that they are intended to be. Thank you to the students who, armed with education, which encompasses the whole person, are going to be able to grasp the opportunity that the investment framework will provide. They will shape our town and our community anchored in a set of core values that we all recognise and aspire to, thanks to the work of this college. So for me, as somebody responsible for driving the investment framework, I would just wish happy birthday to Luton Sixth Form College, and thank you, and through education to the stars. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, good morning, everyone. Um, no one's introduced me, so if you don't know me, I'm Kelvin Hopkins. Uh, my most important job in life is as honorary vice chair of Luton Sits from College Governors. But I have another job as well, but I won't talk about that. Um, <laughs> um, we've heard some wonderful presentations so far from 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 uh, from Chris and and and, uh, and and our local chief executive and so on, and and so from the students as well. But so I might do do a rather more uh, relaxed, if you like, presentation about with some, with some anecdotes as well. Um, Luton Sixth Form College is a quite wonderful institution. It is a jewel in the crown of Luton, but it's also, I think, uh, an exemplar of the most successful institutions in our whole educational system in the country. Uh, this is not just me saying this, because I would say that, wouldn't I? It's actually the statistics produced by the Sixth Form Colleges Association. They produced a manifesto showing that in terms of, uh, of post-16 education, compared with all other, other types of institutions, Six from colleges produce the best qualified students uh, and the best value for money. And why the government doesn't just create scores more of them, I do not understand, but I have explained this to them on many occasions. <laughs> we, and to do that, we've actually set up a, a six from, an all-party parliamentary group of six from colleges, uh, for six from colleges, of which I've been the chair, although now I may have to sort of temporarily vacate that chair while I'm doing something else. Um, but uh, they, they are, it, the six from colleges in general are wonderful, and this is absolutely superb. And uh, our students are so fortunate to have this institution to give them that start in their educational life after 16. Uh, it is indeed the best possible post-16 education you could have, and, and this is evidenced by the fact that in spite of being not socially as advantaged as many other areas, we send we are sent above average numbers of young people to university from Luton, which I think is a just a hardcore evidence of, of success. Um, and I have to say, I must congratulate all the staff at every level, teaching staff, managers, and the support staff throughout the college for all the wonderful work they do. And I do see them, because whenever I've given the opportunity to tour the college and sit in on classes, um, it's, it's a joy to do that. Um, in fact, being um, a, a governor is, is a, a privilege and, and a joy, uh, and something I treasure very much. But going around and seeing staff um, doing their jobs is, is just, just as, as a, a real, real pleasure, and I'm full of admiration for them. And I say this as someone who used to teach A-levels myself. Over 40 years ago, I taught A-levels, but I have to say that the quality of teaching, quality of education that you, the students, get in this college is far and away better than anything I could achieve, although I did my best, I have to say. Um, and, and so, and, but uh, I have lots of personal associations with the college, which I'm very pleased about. I've been a governor for a very long time, um, but I, I, every year it's just exciting and wonderful, and I don't ever want to stop. We have one day to stop, but you know, I don't want it to stop just yet. Uh, I was first appointed as a governor in the early 1980s when Lawrence Martindale was a principal, and I did about three years on the governing body before I went off to become a governor of the Luton College of Higher Education, which became the university, and I became chair of governors of the Luton College of Higher Education in that crucial period. Um, but then uh, I, I ceased to be a governor of that institution, and I came back to the Sipsum College because both my children went here. Um, they were both um, student, the chair of the student council. Both were student governors, not because I prompted them. They just did it, you know, because that's what they do. Um, one of them, of course, my daughter Rachel, was now a governor of the college um, at, with, with me, um, and she's been right through from from the age of 16 right on to, to into, into her current age now as a, as a governor, a long association with the college. And it's actually in the ward she represents on the council, so she's really involved as well. My son Daniel went, was here, student councillor, uh, stu uh, chair of student council as well, and on, on the governing body. Both of them were performers, both of them did their A-levels and went to university uh, uh, from, from this college. So, um, but my wife also was a parent governor, um, and uh, she was involved closely in the appointment of Brian Hausman, one of our principals, and uh, she did a superb job there. And Brian, so come not, not just a principal of the college, but a personal friend as well, and he's here today, I'm glad to see. Um, and, and, but subsequent to my wife standing down as a parent governor, I was then appointed in 1993 as a, um, a what they call a, um, a, a, a business governor um, to, to uh, take the college into its new, the new era of incorporation. Uh, the government at that time decided to take colleges away from local authorities and set them up as uh, independent corporations within the public sector, public sector, publicly funded corporations. And I became a governor. And one thing we did then was to have a particular form of cor corporation. We had representatives from business, yes, um, but we also had 
people who knew about education, people from the local community, and we very carefully assembled a governing body which was you know, about 14, 15 strong, um, but it wasn't what the government wanted. The government wanted a small governing body of just business people because they thought the market would drive and you want business people there and forget about all these fuddy-duddy educationalists. Well, we didn't do that. And what happened was many of the other colleges went wrong in those early years and we didn't. And what happened was the government eventually adopted our form of governing body, not the one they'd originally chosen. And I think we were, we were ahead of the game uh, yet again. So that, that, was, that was very important. I was very pleased that they followed our, our wisdom. Uh, we, we avoided um, mergers at that time and carried on as an independent college, and I think we're, we're currently doing that again, which I think is the right thing to do. But as I say, um, I was, I was a, a teacher myself of A-level, and when I come round the college, one of the things that happens to me, John Ram, head of politics, usually grabs me and makes me do an impromptu a session with his politics students. So I've done a bit of teaching here as well, um, and uh, just to keep my hand in in case I ever need another job, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but, uh, but John, John's become a great, great friend as well. Um, but but, but as I said, both my children went here, my wife was, was a governor, and I was appointed a governor. I've been a governor ever since. Now, that's unusual, because normally you have a fixed term of office, but they've made me a kind of honorary governor because of my political role and because I want to you know, wave the flag for six from colleges in Parliament and in, in government circles, uh, and to have hands-on uh, experience of being a governor of a six from college is very, very important to advance the cause uh, in, in politics. Um, but there's other things about the college which are wonderful. The students are superb and they go off and do great things. And I've had a number of experiences about, um, as Simon will remember actually, and I was on the governing body that appointed Simon, another great success, I have to say. And Simon, we, 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 we dug up from somewhere in the college a 25 year time capsule. Um, of students who'd been there 25 years before and there were some essays in there and one of the essays was by a young man called Paul Gregg advocating anarchy or anarchism should we say um, I don't probably anarchy as well but anarchism uh, and it was a sort of intellectual tract about anarchism which, which I, I don't always follow myself but nevertheless this was there and, and I, I knew Paul Gregg when he was a young man he became chair of the Luton Young Socialist and he felt pretty revolutionary I think he passed on from anarchism to Trotskyism, I, I think. That, but it was a move in, in the sort of constitutional direction, at least, I suppose. Um, anyway, uh, some months ago, I also chair of the all-party parliamentary group for, for social science and policy. And one of the guest speakers we had was Professor Paul Gregg from Bristol University, who's now one of the national experts on, on social mobility. So another success, another alum, alumnus who's, who's gone on to, to great things. He was also a personal advisor to Gordon Brown. I don't know whether that, he had great success there, but nevertheless, <laughs> he, he, was, he, was, he, he was advising uh, uh, Gordon Brown. So you know, we, we've had all these great successes. And then another, uh, another anecdote. Um, in 1999, David Blunkett, who was then Secretary of State for Education, came to open the new refectory in the old building, the new co college uh, dining room. And um, we had the, the, um, the brass plug and the curtains and we made speeches and so on. And after that was over, we went to meet some students, of course. And we sat in a room in the college with about 12 students, some of the brightest and best of the college, and various questions, a question and answer session for half an hour or so, uh, and it all went, went extremely well. One of those students was a young man called Gavin Shuka who subsequently went off to Cambridge University and came back and became my MP, because I actually live in his constituency. So an another success. But you've seen the brochure, you will see this, and some of the other uh, alumni who have made great success in, in, the, in the world. And, and uh, you know, they owe much of their success, I know, to their experience at Sitzram College. But um, I, I have to say that a part of the success is d down, to, down to the governors as well. And I, I say this about other governors rather than myself. I think we've had a series of very f first class governors over many, many years, guided often by the principal, care very carefully, of course, um, and, uh, and quite, well, quite right too. But the governing body, and I've been on a number of governing bodies for different institutions, and this governing body is just head and shoulders above all of the others in terms of its, its wisdom, its skill, um, and its commitment and principle, and dedication, its understanding of education, and so on. Uh, and several of the governors have been here th in, to the college themselves, or have got student, young students here at the, co at, the, 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 um, at the college. But the governing body, uh, and I say this about others, say about other governors my, than, than myself, we've had a series of first-class chairs, none better than the present chair, Sherry Newbury, who does an absolutely wonderful job, I have to say, as the chair of the governors. Um, and I, I've tried to do my best to support the governors over that time as well. But it is, as I say, um, 
a most wonderful institution, something we should be fantastically proud of. We want to see more of them across the country to show, we are showing the world the way we should educate our 18 to 16, eight, 16 to 18 year olds. We get it right and many other institutions don't do anything like as well and so they should follow us. So let's, let's try and just not just wave the flag for, for Luton and for, for Luton Sixman College but tell the world and tell the country in particular that this is the way, this is the way forward. I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. I congratulate all of those who've been uh, associated with the success uh, and I should of course mention Simon's, uh, Simon's great success in getting this new building built because he was the driving force that achieved this. We have a fantastic building as well. So congratulations Simon of course and we've had another first class principal. I have to say I was involved in both the appointments of both Simon and Chris and I think we've got those writers absolutely right as, as well. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for listening to me for a few moments. I'm now going to hand over to um, my very good friend and colleague Cherry Newbury. Thank you. Good morning. As I've already been introduced, I would just tell you that I find it a great privilege to be Chair of Governors of this wonderful college. What a wonderful celebration we've had this morning. Um, it is my pleasure to be asked to thank those who have contributed to the success of today's celebrations. Firstly, to Trevor Holden, thank you for your vision for Luton, including education. Um, it's a vibrant town and we are going places, so thank you for that. Thank you, Kelvin, my colleague and friend of many, many years, for, for today speaking. To our students, past and present, Alistair, Emily, Bjorn, Joanne and Safia, thank you for sharing your experiences. Those are five experiences. Imagine that all the times of the thousands that have gone through the students' uh, experience here, how wonderful it is. And Safia, I have to say, you never come over as nervous at the meetings. <laughs> to Phil Dixon Earl for producing the DVDs which will be available through YouTube or you can contact Janet Jeans here at the college if you'd like a copy. At this point I'd also like to thank Janet for all the hard work that she's put in behind the scenes. She's very, very mild um, in taking praise but she does need to be. She puts on a lot of things for the college and this has run very smoothly, as always, Janet. <laughs> to Alan Crosby and Liz Parker, who have been working hard providing the audio and visual for us all day. They didn't just start when, here, when we started. They were here very early this morning, so we thank them. To Chris Lennon, our PR and communication officer, who worked with Gary Laws and Anderson Lambert to produce the excellent brochure that we have today, commemorative that we can all keep, that shows the first 50 years. And it will bring back many memories to a lot of us that have lived through those times. Chris, I know you spent many hours trawling through the Luton News archives and papers to find all the information from the conception of the, of the college to the building of the first college. So thank you for all your hard work. <laughs> to staff, students, governors, both past and present, thank you for making the college the wonderful place that it is today. It truly is a wonderful place. Thank you to all of you for joining us today to celebrate the milestone in the college's history. And I'm sure you will join with me in wishing the college another 50 years of success and in, in achieving the very best that it can to enable the students to move on to successful careers. Finally, we will end our morning with one final DVD, following which those guests who are staying for lunch are asked to go to the atrium. Lunch will be at 12.15, after which, I see you all looking at your watches. <laughs> After which, um, there will be end of term speeches and farewells to some long members of staff at 1.15. But at that point, I guess you may leave, <laughs> if you so wish. Um, thank you all for attending, um, and we look forward to another very successful 50 years. Thank you. Thank you.